thanks pete for uh, joining me on the filmmakers podcast um yeah i think the the you've kind of elevated the festival like a lot of other films in different ways uh especially like cinematography well. wise you know i really really enjoy what you what kind of sent to us oh i appreciate it man i can't remember how i saw the is it you and jake is that the the first one yeah yeah um me and jake it was um it, that's like my little cousin um and my dog jack um my cousin's called eli um so i just thought you know because he's blonde i'm blonde let's just say it's me and jack you know <laughs> just for a little for a little fun you know um but that was that was for my first project for university that was my first year project um what we basically had to do was do a a six shot film that was 10 second shots but because of the the i re-edited it so it would be a little bit different so it would actually flow a bit better rather than just 10 second cuts if you know what i mean so it does flow a lot better than the original but yeah that's that is i can't quite remember where the did the shots in that first year project have to all be 10 length uh, 10 seconds exactly or a little bit less um for the the module um the actual course mark was for doing 10 second shots so you had to do six 10 second shots exactly which i did okay all right um but it just it didn't fit right properly with me like how many fil- how many films do you see where all the shots are the same length you just don't do you? exactly exactly i think that was the challenge <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely um no, I loved making it. It was great fun. It looked it as well, and he it the uh, your is it your nephew? No, my little cousin. He seemed to be having a lot of fun, and like, were you getting him to kind of chase the camera in those shots? Yeah, yeah, he he was brilliant to work with. Um, this is the first time he's ever been in a film of mine, anyway. Um, and he did fantastic for for the age of him. Um, I, it was done on New Year's Day. I can't remember. Maybe two years ago three years ago um but he was fantastic he followed everything i was saying him to do you know and uh my dog jack that was a different level (laughs) of trying to get him to trying to get him to do what we wanted him to do but um you were trying to uh break that myth about uh pets dogs and pets yeah 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 because that was as soon as i came into it i was like oh first rule of filmmaking don't work with children or animals and i did it the first video i did and it turned it turned out okay turned out okay yeah that that was the first piece of work for anything that i've seen of yours and um was that his jacket because that it kind of that really helped i think sell the idea the blonde hair the yellow jacket I think that worked really well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's his jacket. Yeah, um, I did hope that he had a yellow jacket in my head. He was wearing a yellow jacket, but he just happened to have one, so it was like perfect. Why not? Yeah, because if it, if it had been red, it would have been like very "Don't Look Now." You know, you would have yeah, you would have had a um, the theme. People might have may have thought it had gone sinister if he was wearing red. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I wanted that young look. You know. <laughs> When did you get started? Was it fairly recently or was it a good few years uh, since you kind of first made your first short? Well, in terms of short films, um, I did a, a tech course um, just after I did my GCSEs. So in exchange for like A-levels, um, I did a tech course in media. And that's really where I was able to make my first short film um, with a load of friends of mine. Um and it, it was interesting. Um, I learned a lot from that one tech course. Um, and even before then, um, I did move in image arts as a GCSE. Um, and that really sparked something in me because that's where I started doing work for like businesses and different things. Um, like I was really good. Well, I'm still friends with um, a graphic designer who had clients and he wanted to, you know, get video work out to them, you know, and so I was just like, yeah, absolutely. I'll help you along with that. But in terms of short films, uh, it was in tech and I just fell in love with, you know, camera work and all all the different ways you can like different scenes and everything. I just thought it was so, so interesting. On the experimental, is it Kokoro? Is that the way, right way to pronounce it? 
Well, the experimental film, um, Marikai, I can't even remember the name of it. Um, there's Kokoro, which is, yeah, yeah. Kokoro is the, my, it's my final project film for my university, uh, class. Really so, good standard, man. Very high standard for your class. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. Uh, it's all shot on the Sony A7 III, which I just got there in January past. So I haven't had it a good wee while, but, um, I love it. It's a really great camera. Um, and I was just using some aperture F7, Amaran F7 LED, um, panels for my lighting and some bounce boards and stuff. And just trying to, you know, get nice soft lighting and try and backlight and everything. You know? You're trying to break that kind of, uh, ultra sharp, uh, yeah vibe you get from because that's what you don't want you don't want it pin pin shop unless you're consciously going for that um yeah 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 at what what kind of lenses were you using because it was it photography photography based or was it film kind of uh more sigma or uh well um i only have one lens for my sony a7 III um it was shot on the tamron 26 the 75 i think it is 2.8 and that's the only lens we used for it for the entire film um there was i think maybe a couple shots where i'd used the crop mode in the camera so i could get a wee bit more zoom out of it but um it was all shot on on that one tamron lens and i think it, it performed brilliant this is meant to sound about like a bad thing but it doesn't look like an a7 III. it looks like something a lot more expensive and I think that's yeah. that's that's props to you for the lighting and using the bounce boards, because that is probably the biggest thing that falls down audio and lighting when it comes to student films or, you mm -hmm. know, like when mm -hmm. you're kind of building your rep, building your look. Uh, I think they're mm -hmm. the things that fall down easy. People are too interested in framing straight away. They're not necessarily understanding technique and the kind of subtleties to it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Like, I mean, our audio wasn't. Our audio wasn't great um like we were just it was only two crew it was um me and my friend Oshin, who was the director and writer of the of the film um and he, he just did a fantastic job um you know directing and getting everything out of our actors you know um but we really lacked audio um you know just because we didn't have enough crew i really wish we had a, a sound up somewhere <laughs> but we just didn't have the resources, unfortunately. What you got out of it for two people is is pretty, really decent. Um, oh yeah, I love that little tease you sent to me, and uh, yeah, that one of the biggest reasons I wanted to speak to you is because the level of um, your cinematography skills are really strong, and if this is what you're getting from a university course, I can only see like better things for you, uh, just because mm, the standard the standards are really high, man, and like the use of color. Did you? Uh, did you grade it or was that the director that was doing that? Um, well, I was editor as well. Um, director sat down with me as well, um, just, you know, to get what he really wanted out of it. Um, but color wise, um, I just did a simple, you know, color correction, just making sure it was right. And then I applied a, a lot because, you know, they're very, you can get very good one. It was a Rex 709 um, one can't remember where it was from honestly but just tweaked about you know it was just a very basic lot i suppose i think he used a different one as well at some point where at the the title sequence at the start it's quite grayscale looking um that was a different one but um I, i'm trying to develop my color as well like i was trying to you know imitate those lots doing it in my own way because i'd sometimes color grade in lightroom i'd take a frame for my film and I do it in Lightroom because that's where I edit my photos. So I know the ins and outs of it really well. So um, to get, you know, what I want and, know, and I know how to do it through Lightroom, not so much through Final Cut. How do you apply that to the rest of the film? So if you grade a frame in, then how do you apply that back into the whole film? Um, well, so you get your frame and you, you just do whatever you want to it. Um, and then you export that frame and you just apply it through the to the whole clip in Lightroom because you can't edit the video in Lightroom so it's you have to do it clip by clip it's really not a great way to do it if you're under like pressure or anything but um it's just fun to experiment around in it um that's just how I would I like to do it sometimes 
but I didn't do it for that in, in any of my shorts that are in the festival. It was just more of just a play around kind of technique. <laughs> Those skills are, are translatable. You know, within a short amount of time, you'll you'll learn resolve or oh, yeah. whatever you need to use for color. I just apply, mm. I just have this on Gen 5 color science now, and I've just put the, um, the Gen 5 color on uh, for extended video for what I do. Because I was trying to develop something over, I was overthinking it for something that was simpler, like just doing these recordings. Mm. And mm. I kind of, I've pushed the shadows up a little bit, but that's, that's kind of uh, the minimal look I needed. And that's, yeah. yeah, that's something that can develop over time. But if you're doing that in Lightroom, then as soon as you understand the other tool sets that you'll be kind of, you'll be kind of sorted then really. Yeah. Well, I mean, try, I've just love playing about with the, you know, the tables and, all the different things in it. I can't remember off the top of my head the names or anything, but like just the color wheels and different things, you just sort of slide them about, see what it looks like, and if it looks nice, then fair enough, <laughs> you know. Um, That's the biggest problem a lot of people, younger filmmakers that that just apply lots. They think, oh, I'll shoot it in S log. I, I've watched a YouTube video. I'll just apply a lot. That looks nice. Mm -hmm. That's that's acceptable. That's doable. But if you don't really understand what's going on, mm -hmm. you can't really mm -hmm. develop colors or looks yourself. Definitely, yeah. Especially with like with black magic that I've got, it a lot of people go down the kind of teal, you know, bluey mm -hmm. green look that it's kind of seen as a standard. And if you don't know yeah. how it's all working, then you can't really mature um, your skill set any further. There are moments in the film where it is rather teal and orange i think it just worked though because our character was ginger so it really you know set her hair off and but know. it wasn't it wasn't really it wasn't really going past when it mm. starts to look ridiculous where it's popping too much um yeah yeah it's kind of a there's a richness to the film in terms of the color and i really like that and it suited oh, the location in the farm as well it kind of mm -hmm. suited the kind of warm uh <laughs> farm-like tones if, if you that makes any sense if you yeah, yeah you picture yeah, yeah, a farm yeah. you picture this color palette don't you you know like browns yeah, and yeah, greens sort of and like, all of that you know yeah uh, i'm glad right. you understand that <laughs> no no i do i do my cousins are farmers so they i'm, I'm i know all about that kind of stuff so yeah i would see a lot of like rouge browns and maroons and all that there kind of stuff on a farm so but yeah if i said to you the the joker the new, the the newest one. You you know the mm -hmm. color the color range in your head, what it what it looks like. So, yeah. yeah, props to you for the color as well. I really I really quite enjoyed that. Oh, thank um, you so much, man. What um so the what was the short film where was it the guy that was breaking into the house? Uh, that's not part yes. of the festival. What was what was the name of that film? Uh, it's called Sweat. What did you shoot that on in terms of the gimbal? Uh, that was shot on a. Zion, Zion, Korean. I think it's a V2. It's not the Korean 2. It's the, I, th I think it's a development of the uh, V1 or whatever one they had before. It's really old. I still have it somewhere, but I haven't taken it out in a wee while. Um, but that on, I, I thought it worked really well. It was shot in the S6300. Um, that was my primary camera for years, like four, four or five years, I think I used that camera. Um, until I upgraded to the other Sony, um, but it, it worked really well. Um, we must have shot that film about 15 times to try and get it right. I was ended up, you know, sitting at the edge of the car, you know, it was, it was quite intense. Um, I was just sitting, the window was open in the car and my, one of my legs was in one's out and I was just sort of sitting out like at an angle <laughs> trying to get his face um and then as soon as he pulled up i just sort of leaped my leg out and just trailed him along and then we sort of had the time how long it would take him to get out of the house again um but luckily with that that we only tried that idea maybe a few different times but it, it worked out really well in the end i think anyway um that was what another one of my uni projects it was shoot a one minute long take for a short film so um it, it's like you know when you see a, a camera move or a big camera move you think, oh they're just showing off now but I, yeah. I kind of like the premise more than the shot it, well they kind of match each other really well and mm -hmm. it's really it re really really nice um so yeah you kind of 
did you plot any kind of particular movements or was it just like the timing more than anything else um well my mate jordan who's in the film um jordan glover um he um basically he actually came up with the idea he was like well let's head up to my to my granny's and um we'll shoot something up there with the car and uh, he brought his uh, airsoft pistol um and you know he could drive at the time i didn't um so it was basically wherever he could go um is where we were having to go to um but he you know he came up with most of it honestly he got the ideas of you know running through the house but obviously i couldn't get in through the window with the gimbal and all to make it you know smooth so i just thought right i'll just have to run back and you know follow the outside of the house and then apply some audio to it so you know you know what's going on inside um but he he made most of it he really made that film um so he did a fantastic job honestly so um where did the i'm not going to say obsession but where did the uh the liking of uh gimbal uh moves and technique was that was that from just enjoying the process or was it more from kind of influences in cinema um i think it was because at the time um it was probably one of my bigger purchases so i wanted to use it a lot <laughs> so uh yeah 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 but at now i'm like oh, i hate gimbals i can't use them anymore um i was i'm really trying to move towards handheld um kind of ways and you know um the, our film kokoro was all shot handheld um apart from two drone shots at the start of the end but um they're, everything they're was nice, shot handheld. Really nice, yeah i oh, appreciate it man that was all on the dji mini 2 which is a fantastic little drone. Um, I love it, especially for the money. Like it's it's crazy that what you can get out of it. Yeah, the standard um, on such a uh, low price DJI in terms of their drone products is is pretty sensational. It's, and and the, the, the footage you get, the the mm. even for amateurs, you know, in terms of the modes and the kind of circle mode or follow and Saturn and you know the kind of yeah the kind of um, I wouldn't say uh, childlike. Uh, modes but they kind of get you used to it and that was something else yeah. i with my drone I, uh, i've got the mavic air the, the first one mm -hmm. and i wanted to see what those techniques were and then i wanted to do everything manual so it's all auto mm -hmm. initially when i learned and then it was right i want to go full manual now and then it's like understand you know when you want to do a parallax or something as soon as you do that on mm -hmm. a drone you understand how it works it's like oh this is fantastic now um yeah i've never had luck with drones honestly i had my first drone was the air um and i loved it until um the whoever i'd bought it off it was off some dodgy website <laughs> um so it arrived used when i thought when they claimed it was new so there's a whole thing about that um where i had to get paypal involved and it was just a nightmare so I ended up returning it and then buying, what did I buy? Instead of a drone, I bought a load of other equipment. When you have an experience like yeah. that online, eBay or whatever service or website you use, it exactly. really just, right, I want to get away from that, hate that, that's kind of ruined. Now what can I mm -hmm. put the money on, you know? So what did you yeah, uh, exactly. what did you buy instead? Um, so at the time, um, I was still running my S6300. So I just thought, I'm just going to rig this out. I'm just going to completely maximize my potential with it. So I bought, you know, I was going to buy external batteries and stuff. So I bought a load of NPF batteries, um, bought a V mount adapter to NPF. So I could power it off NPF batteries rather than the V mount. Cause they're near enough impossible to get here in Northern Ireland. Um, what V mounts? The V mount batteries. Yeah you can't you can't get batteries here unless you buy it from an actual firm here but the, the prices are crazy so is that like um, an imp import thing of bat that particular battery or voltage or something yeah I, I don't honestly know what it is but any if you try and buy even an external battery from amazon or like a portable charger you can't get it here and i don't know why 
Well, that, that's that's so, fascinating. That's really yeah. I'll, I'll send you some of the slides. I'll send you some of the slides. You want. <laughs> I would so appreciate that. I would so appreciate. It. Yeah. Um, I'll but, just say it's a cake. Um, I'll just say it's a cake or something. You know. On the, on yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> just duct tape everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ah, uh, no, it's it's crazy that I've only got four MPF batteries all all together, which powers my two lights and then two for powering the camera um so i bought that um i bought i think another lens i bought the it's a sony 24 to 105 i think it was um what else was there i think no i had the gimbal before that and then i bought those lighting um the two f7s i bought a third led panel um what else did i buy i can't even remember um I think just some hard drives and different things like that. Just you know, the boring stuff. The boring stuff. Yeah, just all what you need, you know. Because I can't, I can't. Because I have so many clients and stuff. Like I have to back up stuff just to make sure it's all there. So that's when the um, paranoia sets in, isn't it? When you when you're dealing with this, dealing with cash and money, yeah, and clients, you, you can't afford to make any mistakes. Like um, definitely not. I um I shot um some drone footage for a school in North Wales. Uh, this mm-hmm. was this was a couple of years ago, and even that, even after, even when I've got the drone in the car and I've got the footage on the tiniest little memory card, I get so mm-hmm. par- get so paranoid about the footage. Um, I thought about getting one of those. Yeah. I can't remember the, the the company. They do one of those drives. You can just slot the memory card in, back it up. But I really mm-hmm. don't like the idea of one of those. So, yeah, I just I end up with, I've got two backups of everything I've done since two thousand and one. And mm. it's crazy. It's like a tin tin hat thinking. You know what I mean? Sometimes where I've where I've got like freelance stuff, I do less and less freelance stuff because I I just kind of focused about um, kind of enjoying what I do at the moment. But mm. especially with like weddings and things like that, it's it gets really stressful. And um, I just wanted to kind of go back on something you mentioned. Why? Mm. What? What put? What? What's kind of put you off um, shooting on the gimbal? Is it kind of the slightly unnatural feel to it or is there, is there a different kind of thinking behind that um i think it was because i used it basically on everything i did and then i just got fed up with it i got fed up with the look of it um you know it does there is an aspect of unnatural to it you know it just sometimes it would sort of jitter slightly or you know just go a wee bit off and it, it just drove me insane so i was like i'm not using that anymore um so i just thought right i'll only use it if necessary um i would have used it in my film kokoro but i thought i, I tried to balance my 7.3 and it just didn't work <laughs> it just didn't balance properly even though on the box there's a picture of an a7 series camera doesn't and it's the uh, Zion Crane, isn't it? V2. Yeah, V2. It's nothing, you know, fancy. I think at the time I spent maybe four hundred pound on it or something. You could probably buy one now for about a hundred and something pound, maybe. What lens were you trying to balance it with? Uh, just the one that I had, the Tamron. Um, so odd, so odd. They wouldn't, yeah. especially. The worst thing is I've got um, uh, a Ronin um, S, and. Um, not the S. The SC has got huge advantages in terms of the little locks for mm-hmm. each. You can each access has got a little lock on that. That's the big plus with that. Yeah, um, yeah. And because I uh, externally, I'm looking to shoot taking my Ronin S and putting my Black Magic on it and putting it on this uh, um, Matrice drone that someone else is going to be piloting just for just for some tests coming up, like some super high end mm-hmm. tests. And that's the only reason yeah. I kind of kept my Ronin because I wanted to go progress my drone stuff that there kind of that far um mm-hmm. but yeah it can be really frustrating balancing and I, because of the pocket 4k i use you have to actually mm-hmm. counterbalance it with a um a mp uh the sony batteries on the actual uh oh, yeah. on the arm because it's so like you have to slide to one side it's such a pain but it's yeah. nice it's nice for for doing little things like i've, I've shot the some stuff recently and i've gone more mm-hmm. from handheld i've kind of gone the other way a little bit i shoot i okay. shoot probably sh- less short films than you do but i've kind of <sighs> gone from handheld and shoulder which i love the kind of the whole 
Paul mm-hmm. Greengrass thing, but his techniques mm-hmm. almost it's almost gone too far now. I think. I, I think he, right. need, he needs to rein that in a little bit, Paul Greengrass, but that's just my thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, and then I've kind of gone the other way to gimbal. I kind of like doing really subtle movements, almost like slider, but mm-hmm. like minimizing the use of it. Like, um, you know, the pano mode on iPhones and, and Google phones, mm-hmm. where you just pan yeah. a huge image. I It's yeah. kind of like that where I go halfway and that's the image I want. I don't want to mm-hmm. go the full full width because it looks ridiculous. So I kind mm-hmm. of I kind of apply those rules, not rules, but um, how I want to shoot something that way. Yeah, I kind of minimize my gimbal shots. But that's why I loved that's why I loved your shots. It's like, whoa, he's gone like whoa, he's gone that far, you know, with it, uh, which is great. <laughs> and I think yeah. it kind of, I think you kind of matured uh, from what I've seen of your work. You kind of matured how you make things look and your final piece is really nice and how mm. um how well received has that been on your course um as in kokoro you mean or yeah um it hasn't actually been shown yet to anybody apart from the lectures and the markers um but i, I don't know when I'll, when it's going to be released honestly but i know we're going to be having an end of year show where everybody from the university and whoever else wants to go and see it um that that's when the main premiere basically you would say um but no one else has really seen it i haven't put it anywhere yet it's on private on vimeo at the moment um just because i, I want to make sure it's tip top <laughs> you know you want to kind of squeeze oh. the any little frames all you want to make sure it's perfect yeah um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when is when is that premiere? Um, I can't remember the exact date. I think it's somewhere in June. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but there was an email I got a couple of weeks ago or something about from my lectures who were organising a drive-in theatre because normally at the end of year show um of of our course, it's all of our short films are shown in a cinema. So a full, awesome, big screen um, of everyone's film. But because of, you know, COVID, um, we'll have to do it outside or at least we plan to do it outside. Um, so I'm, I'm not too sure how that's going to work exactly because, you know, projector outside, you know, the, the dark or black level is going to be... That's going to kill brutal. some films, going to make some films look better. Yeah. And I totally sympathize with that because when I was on a, a more of a film production rather like behind the scenes producing films and when films were shown on uh, the corner house in Manchester, it's now, I think it's called home in Manchester. It's a kind of a really, it's like a, uh, I'm going to say a bit of a snobby kind of uh, um, uh cinema but it's really nice they've got good sound good project uh, good yeah, setups yeah. but when no one was allowed to test their films on the projectors uh, or on the or okay. on the digital projection so when i saw my film and how i color timed it and all of that i was really quite pissed off because everything was a bit too dark and we weren't yeah, allowed yeah. to make any adjustments after so i can totally oh. sympathize with that and the biggest thing is how it's going to sound because a lot of drive-in mm-hmm. cinemas drive through or whatever they have you got to tune the sound in through your car radio so oh yeah it's gonna, be, it's gonna be interesting that and the reason i ask I about no the idea. date the reason i ask about the date is because i don't want it to kind of uh clash i don't want it to clash but if it if you can let me know i'll if you can't sh- if i can't show the whole film during the live event which i'd love to um oh no absolutely you can show it the because I think it's, I think it's really, really nice. I want to. I'm definitely going to show at least two, and I want to show all the f- submissions. I think I'm going to show all. Basically, all the submissions are going to be shown on the 26th of June, kind of back to back with me doing a little Perfect. intro. That's that's going to be. That's not going to be live, but it's going to be like a mm-hmm. bit of a monstrous edit. You know what it's like. You know when you edit editing yeah. something, you want to really smash it, don't you? Absolutely. So you like Kokoro yeah. when it's projected or when it's seen by your peers. I know mm-hmm. exactly what you you're going through. You want it to look the best. Yeah, I'm gonna end up sitting in, I don't know, the car probably. Just gonna be sitting like this. 
<laughs> just, just saying. I know it's it's a it's tough. Like definitely, I get tense about the graphic that's going out. What eleven minutes ago for a podcast that's coming out on Friday? Do you know, like is yeah. this going to look right? Like um, when I spell something incorrectly for the festival, and it's on a mm. graphic, and I'm like fuck it, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna delete that. It's it's part of it. It's, it's the issue I have when I always make a spelling mistake somewhere. And when, mm. when I'm dealing with um, quite a lot of filmmakers' names from all over the world, I always make some, at least one mistake. Not, I haven't made yeah. it yet. You see, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, uh, I can totally appreciate that. Um, Absolutely, so man. Who, you kind of, um, who do you kind of look towards and um, what kind of cinema do you like? Oh, um, recently I've just started getting into thrillers. I used to hate them because I hated tension. But um, for my dissertation for university, I I did my whole dissertation on tension and cinematography and different techniques and how that all worked. Um, so I was really into watching, you know, really intense stuff like, what is it? It's um, Prisoners, I think it's called. Um, Roger Deakins work in that is just insane. Prisoners um, is it's brutal, but it's really it's a great movie. Fantastic! I it's I did a scene analysis of I believe it's whenever the detective goes to one of the suspects' house and then he finds all the boxes and you know I I just followed that through and just you know analyzed every single part of it to do with lighting and camera angles shot types you know just everything that i could to do with cinematography um and a lot of the techniques in from that um really did inspire me to do it in kokoro before i started to do or before our shoots i always watched something the night before just you know oh, i'm gonna try this maybe tomorrow or something because i didn't actually have a shot list or anything we sort of made up all of the shots on the spot which was quite dumb idea <laughs> you know it was was it a dumb idea in your mind because of time it was taken or um see i don't work with shot lists honestly um i don't think i've ever used one on a short film that i've made it's always made up on the spot because i just think you know you're gonna do your best when you're on location whenever you know because in my head i didn't really go to much, many of the locations beforehand um, because during our first plan for Kokoro, we had a single location where there was a house, um, you know, a big shed area, um, and everything we needed all in one place. But um, due to health and safety circumstances, you know, we could not use that house. Um, the interior was such a disappointment. Um, so we actually had to shoot all of the locations separate on different days so all of our interior scenes are shot in belfast um which is an hour away from us and all of the exterior scenes are shot at uh, oshin's grandparents house and their farm area so you know it's all all over the place and we really had to try and match it together without showing that they're completely different places i think it definitely works because i was i was sold on it i was sold on uh oh, that's good <laughs> and you can you can is the reason that the interiors that you didn't like on the original location was because it wasn't going to match the farm area no it's, uh, i don't even know if i'm allowed to say but it's like hygiene it was not good it was not good. <laughs> Seriously, it was it made you a wee bit sick, honestly. So it was just not I didn't want to bring our cast in there. It was just too much, honestly. But um we, we just didn't have enough time, honestly, to clean it up or anything, which was the disappointing thing because it would it's such a beautiful house, but it, the state of it was just not not good. Absolutely grim is an understatement, honestly. No, I'm not even joking though. <laughs> if you could have seen it, it's bad. Um, you must have been really. Was that on a location scout where you saw the insider and thought this isn't going to work? Yeah, see, Oshin knew the guy, um, and he really wanted the he he trusted the guy, 
um and then whenever like the the house was no one really was in it for months at a time because the guy was at uni so the way we came up we were we came up a week before our planned shoot dates and we were just like we need a different place we need a different place as soon as possible so i got into contact with the producer um that i'm doing a documentary with tomorrow um so he was lucky enough to find us a place you know it was it was called the harrison hotel it's in belfast so it's uh it's in the middle of the city and we were trying to play it off as a house in the country so it was really quite extreme because we, i didn't want to show outside the window as much yeah i can imagine yeah so because it's just all buildings you know and i'm trying to play it off as um some country home and to even play along with that as well was our audio all you could hear was cars so that's another audio issue of it was it all kind of adr not no none of it was um adr at all it was all you know done properly through the microphone but if you do really listen you can hear cars going past and stuff if you really listen to it (laughs) <laughs> and then you'll really notice yeah if you look out the the window of um the bed scene um of her walking past if you look out the window you can see a street and like a church and everything which is i mean realistically you wouldn't notice because your focus is supposed to be on her walking past so but i think we kind of got away if you if you got if you didn't notice then it worked it worked <laughs> i think it was because because of the the quality of what was on screen i think that you know in terms of the story and the performances mm. especially her performance what's the name of the the lead in the film uh she's called una hendren um i initially thought is she gonna speak into the whole thing and the reason i thought that is it doesn't matter if she was gonna mm. speak or not because i thought she was selling her performance just with uh, how she was looking and performing and that's a yeah. real that's a real skill absolutely she's a she's a theater actor actress um you know she she's fantastic at what she does um so Oshin found her um she i think i believe is doing drama at the, at the university that we're going to ulster university um so she was a really good find um and our other actor, Adam Murphy, um, I reached out to him uh, through Instagram. And we really needed somebody who knew how to do fight scenes and choreography and that kind of stuff. So he's a very skilled, you know, fighter, martial arts guy. Um, I can't remember what it's called. I, I don't know if it's Taekwondo or not, <laughs> but he's black belt guy like he's 100% um so he really fit the role well um and he's been in short films before which was even better so he he knew what he was doing in terms of you know acting and following lines and being directed and everything even but, the kind of the patience with younger filmmakers as well that that's super important mm, because if you've got a seasoned actor absolutely. and they haven't worked on short films with um relatively younger people it can mm. you can see i've seen it before firsthand my I was working on a short film on my third year, not mine. Uh, and you could see that the actors were getting frustrated with the crew. And, mm-hmm. you know, these are all good people. Like one of the chaps that shot the short where the actors were getting frustrated works for like GQ. Now he does some, he stu- he shoots on Ari Amira and, you know, his stuff's really, really great. But at that point, those two actors were really getting a little bit kind of ratty. So if you've got someone, you know, that, understands the short film process and uh has the respect for the filmmakers as well it only bodes well for what you end up producing you know no i I couldn't ask for any better actors honestly uh they were so easy to work with uh, like just loved doing it they were so passionate about it as well which is so good for us um because they really sold their characters uh so well um and like you know we gave adam the freedom to you know make your own character like develop your character because we really thought you know if he's gonna make a better character 
if he knows in his own head, you know, he, I knew he'd be able to play it off anyway, but we really gave him the freedom to just be himself and just do what he thought would work. That's the biggest thing, uh, biggest compliment I can give you is um, the story, really. For me, obviously, story is always paramount. And then, mm. like, like you know, if you build your skill sets up, you can apply uh, any of your techniques you've learned over the years to um, a story you're trying to trying to uh, tell. And it was it Absolutely. was really nice, man. It was uh, we've had such a mix of films from experimental films from India about isolation to mm. uh, more seasoned films. We've had one film that's shot on thirty five mil, which was really nice. Awesome. And for, awesome. for a short film that's less than three minutes, that. Because initially, initially we had just a one to three minute, which is actually four minutes with credits. Um, yeah, well, that was the only category we had. But because of uh, a couple of filmmakers I know that wanted to submit, um, we opened up it opened it up to longer longer shots as well, and that's kind of bed bed fruit really well. Uh, we had an mm -hmm. animation from Japan the other day um, that's going to be yeah, it's going to be really it's going to be really interesting putting all the films together for the first day, showcasing all the films. Because I've got, Amazing. including your experimental, we've got some really interesting experimental films. And, you know, I don't want to kind of bunch all the experimental films together and then go into the narrative and then comedy mm -hmm. or whatever. I think I'm going to mix it across the board. So that's going to be the most difficult thing. It's not the edit. I've done like a thousand yeah. times. It's the uh, getting the, the balance right, you know? You yeah, want something yeah, that's absolutely. wow straight away. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's really interesting and... Uh, it's fascinating curating all these films and and seeing the submissions come in. Um, Absolutely, man. Because I like I, I really like simple. What I'm trying to develop now is simple uh, anamorphic stuff because I shoot on uh, anamorphic lenses and mm -hmm. I kind of I'm trying to develop this kind of bigger project and uh, minutes like what you said about watching something the night before. I watched uh, before I went to do this camera test the other day, other week. Mm -hmm. Um, I watched uh, uh, 30, is it 40 thousand leagues under the sea because that's shot in anamorphic right. or Panavision and it's it's really wide it's it was on Disney mm -hmm. plus it's really wide and it's okay. like right what are they trying to do with this scene and then they cut closer and ch change the angle for something more important so it was super minimal and obviously yeah. they, they've got big big cameras back in the day in what 60s or whatever it was shot yeah um, but it's really fascinating to see how anamorphic shot compared to 16 by nine you know um yeah so that's something that's a discipline i'm trying to learn rather than you know handheld stuff or gimbal which i i kind of like as well um mm -hmm. but yeah it's um it's it's a really good idea kind of it gets your juices flowing doesn't it for a shoot Absolutely. when you watch something good definitely man like i would love to shoot anamorphic at some point um it is it's ridiculous like even for Kokoro, we originally had planned to use uh, Blackmagic 6K Pro to shoot the whole film on, but due to the sheer lack of storage capacity, batteries, like it's insane. So we just had to be like, right, uh, we're going to have to change up here because we just didn't have, you know, the SSD space. We didn't have enough batteries. Like, I only have two batteries for the Sony and we shot an entire day on one. You know, it was, it's crazy. It's, it's fantastic. I'll sort you out the Velox, mate. I'll send them over. I'll smuggle them over. <laughs> I, that yeah, seems, really that seems them. so crazy to me that, that that's like, yeah, I almost want to solve that problem. You know what I mean? I know it's, it's, it is crazy. I, I don't even there's a whole lot of other stuff that you know goes on about here and i'm not i kind of understand why they won't let us have batteries because <laughs> there's a whole thing whole thing that will not will not even go into there not even go into that absolutely man i totally understand where you're coming from with that um, yeah but yeah it's uh i i shifted to vlock because of that reason i shot on the pocket 4k mm. and i i love the speed booster and the look i get and the low light i can get um mm. and yeah i i switched to there's no way because this camera takes um uh, lpe sixes and there was no right. way i could shoot on those i'd get like 20 minutes out of a battery something like that yeah it's it's crazy i think the 6k pro it now has it runs on npf batteries so it gives it a wee bit more power um and even still like 
we were 50% down and we shot maybe three shots <laughs> or something. I don't know. It was probably just really bad battery, but either way, it was just too much. So uh, what have you kind of uh, been watching recently during lockdown? What kind of, um, what kind of, what do you enjoy watching? Uh, well, um, I'm a sucker for watching, you know, um, what, do, what do you call them? Just easy going films. Not quite. Um, although I don't mind them. <laughs> well, I would normally watch, you know, like The Office or something just because it's there. It's funny. It's my sense of humor. Love it. Um, but if we're talking films, you know, thrillers, like I've, I've been trying to watch a film every, well, I'm really bad at watching films, actually. Like I've only watched maybe like once a week. Like, it's not good. Like, I don't tend to watch films often enough than I think I should. Um, Like, I would usually watch something on a Wednesday evening just because it always ends up that way. It's not intentional or anything. Um, It's just, I think it's the point of where I'm like, I know I want to watch a movie. <laughs> you know, it's it's always on a Wednesday for some reason. But like, like I said, I watched um Prisoners there. Um, what else was it? It was Law Abiding Citizen, was another one that I watched. It was quite intense. Um, yeah, I um, I I worked on a. This was in two thousand and seven. I worked on a Gerald Butler mm. film, a feature film, right? Piers Brosnan. It was a really, it was a really small film. Uh, I mm. ended up working for Irish Dreamtime, uh, Brosnan's production company, and awesome. he was Gerald Butler. He was always late to set, like always mm. one of those types, you know, but. It was it was great fun doing it, and the experience I had was amazing. Um, but mm. yeah, law abiding citizens. I really like kind of the way that how the way some of that works. And I'm I'm mm. a I'm a big fan of a really you know decent thriller. And if it bored yeah. like going into action, like I like I like switching off. I like watching um, Below Deck on Netflix. It's awful. It's really awful about this crew that looks after. I don't even know what that is. It's really bad. It's it basically it's about it's a reality show about people who work on um, uh, cruise ships, not cruise ships, um, like super yachts, that kind of thing. It's okay. really terrible. That's, that's but then, terrible. but then I love watching. I love you know uh, Fellini or whatever you know sometimes. Mm. And I, you know I like a broad range of things. I I don't just like one genre. You know I love. I yeah. Love, yeah. I love horror as well. I'm a big fan of horror. Um, right I, I can't i don't know i'm not a horror guy like i don't know why try shooting a horror that'll be that'll be good oh, to see I know. from you man yeah i uh, did i shoot a horror before there was a horror module on university course but for some reason i didn't do it i did experimental instead which is where i did my experimental film which is what is now in your hands <laughs> i love um, it I, I really enjoyed that yeah and oh, some, sometimes that. I can put my finger on why I enjoy things and with mm. artists, you know, like if you see a Jackson Pollock or uh, if, you know, if you go to Louvre and see, you'd see Da Vinci, you can see why you like certain things. But mm. that's what I like about experimental. Like sometimes I don't know why I really like something, which is yeah. kind, of, kind of ridiculous. But uh, that's, what's, that's what's great about one of the reasons I put that experimental award uh, laurel out. And mm. because of we had... I tick the box for accepting uh, experimental films because I, I really enjoy them and it's it's so different to what we've had before mm. because we've had, and it's seeing the differences in the experimental films and the reasoning, the backgrounds of people. Like we've had one from Argentina, from from right. a twenty year old uh, filmmaker there, and we've had yours, and we've had some from, uh, like six from India, something like that, and Crazy. and two or three of them I spoke to the uh, Indian filmmakers and they're kind of reflecting what's going on now, especially with the COVID in India, which is, you know, really, yeah. really awful. Um, yeah. And I can see why, you know, why it takes things from your life. Like comedians do it, you know, where mm -hmm. you see something in it that happens in uh, like Peter Kay sees something that happens in everyday life. And he just kind of extrapolates on that and, and makes it his own yeah. makes a great joke or make, you can make a short film out of, so, some experience like i had i had covid in december and i i really right. wanted to make a um it was really bad dose i was in hospital for two weeks but i oh, i had yeah. severe nightmares that first week and everyone in the ward i was in had severe nightmares the week they got it 
So wow. I was thinking well, that's going to that's going to kind of infiltrate into my kind of uh, writing a horror short about something like mm. almost like a Freddy Krueger thing where not everyone's yeah. having a shared dream, but uh, yeah, that that you know if you can if you can see inspiration in um, uh, something around you it, uh, in experimental film or narrative, it can only mm. enhance only enhance what you do. Absolutely, like I mean, funny you should say that things around um, in doing an experimental film because it was at like you know the peak lockdown here. Um, I was basically in this room almost basically every day, every hour, um, and I was really trying to you know think of what the frig am I gonna do for an experimental film? Like I had no idea because I could do so much, but. I couldn't think of what to do. So I bought some A1 card paper um, and just propped it up on my desk and lit it with some with those LED panels. And this cabinet here is full of random things that my mum has. And, you know, I just started filming it and using, using one of my lights and just doing this with it. And that's how that's that experimental film made was yeah. just moving that single light around random objects like there's a pine cone in that film <laughs> yeah like um and seeing how the light works that that in yeah. that in uh, some ways is going to help you you know like understanding how light works because mm. i don't have the greatest understanding of light like the the cinematographer friend i told you about the work for gq his lighting mm. now he's lit footballers for promos that kind of thing his understanding yeah. of light is like way above. And even yeah. when you experiment for your experimental film for lighting a pine cone, you start to understand how things work. So practice is is key, really, isn't it, for lighting? And absolutely. Uh, I think that like when you use bounce panels for the first time, like you did in Kokoro, I, I mean mm. it's not your first time using them, but it's yeah, uh, yeah. when you start to understand how these things really work, it's like, oh my god it just elevates your work straight away, doesn't it? Absolutely. Like I've got a bounce light here and then I've got one of my newer lights. I just, they just arrived yesterday. The uh, fours of sixties. Newer are great. you like all those, all those small rig, all those kind of, uh, thir- well, newer is good. It's fantastic. I meant as in like, it's an, it's one of my new lights, <laughs> but my newer is fantastic. It's that's what the stand is there. And you know everything; those uh, bounce boards are newer as well. Like so, but um, yeah, definitely newer is fantastic for the money. Anyway, it's it's insane. These are, I think these are nicer. I think it's a brand called Nicer, uh, but these are copies of um, uh, the small rig ones, and these got the leather handles. And this oh, nice. price wise, they were so much better because I wanted the full handles, you see, because I like mm. I like documentary, you know, the, the handheld and the mm. natural yeah. feel to capturing in the in the moment. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, it's uh it's nice getting your bits and bobs. And mm. when I when I switch to my this is just the small rig V log um, uh. V log plate. When I switched to that, it made a huge difference. So yeah, I'll 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 figure a way to smuggle some V lock batteries and uh, we'll sort something out. <laughs> yeah, man, get get them across. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Uh, Pete, uh, uh, thank you so much, mate, for being on the uh, podcast, and thank you again no for problem. submitting your films. And um, Instagram is the best way to kind of uh, keep up to date with everything that's going on. Uh, yes, but, I'll, yeah, I'll follow it now. I'll, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out. But it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure, man. Absolute yeah, pleasure. and uh, I w- uh, congrats on the on all your films. Kokoro's excellent. I only Thank see pos- so I only see positive things, and if you want to get into thrillers, I think mm. that's that's a really strong start because of what I've seen of other films on other courses in the UK and especially in Northwest where I'm from, it's a mm. really really strong film, and it doesn't look like an A73. It looks like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's maybe to do with the moment Cine Bloom. I was wondering whether you got like Black Pro Mist or something. Yeah. That's, I've got it on this camera here, um, so you're gonna see it quite, quite faded and nice. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be way better than uh, most standard webcams. Yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, uh, cheers, dude, and che- yeah, thanks again, Pete. It's really appreciated that you submitted the great films, mate. Not a problem, man. Thanks for having me. I'll keep you up to date with when the podcast. Will, it'll probably be out 
when I'm going to York for a week. So there's okay. a that I I'm going to sign off like uh, for a week and just have content popping out. Um, but I'll re, I'll cool. be responding even though my missus won't be happy about it. I'll be responding to messages and stuff. So. Ah, oh, not a worry, man. Not a yeah. worry. Well, have a good day, mate. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Yeah. You too, sir. You too. All the best.